hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator. All right, welcome back to the uh, next episode of the Just Law Podcast. I'm your host, Tom Blakely. Uh, I am joined today by none other than uh, Professor Olson, professor of BC Law. He teaches patent law, IP law, antitrust, and various seminars. Uh, professor Olson also serves as the faculty director for the program on innovation entrepreneurship. Uh, he researches and writes primarily in the areas of patents, copyrights, antitrust, uh, patent law, copyright law, music licensing, and First Amendment copyright issues. Uh, he's joining us today because I was uh, perusing my uh, Wall Street Journal the other morning. I was reading up about uh, this case that I think a lot of people are talking about, Apple, uh, Epic Games versus Apple. Uh, and I, you know, was reading here in the article by uh, Tim Higgins and uh, Sarah Needman and then the Herald, oh, sorry, not the Herald, uh, my, my newspapers mixed up in the Wall Street Journal about the case. And they were talking about uh, the, the judge who, uh, according to according to someone, thinks that it might not be a slam dunk for Apple saying, uh, it's safe to say she's not, ju- she's not just convinced that there's an easy one for Apple. Uh, she's thinking hard about this and seems to be bothered by the lack of in-app or in-game payment systems. And that quote is by none other than David Olson, associate professor at BC Law and my advisor uh, in my 1L year. So I figured like we got to have, have him on the podcast. Professor Olson, how are you today? I'm great. Thanks. And thanks for having me. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so I just wanted to talk about uh, this case. This has been something that uh, I've followed pretty, pretty, pretty well because uh, it's something that uh, just my previous work uh, in, in technology and entertainment, it was something that I always worried, you know, wondered about this 30% cut that Apple takes from, uh, you know, everyone in their, in their Apple store and in-app purchases and uh, this, this sort of issue of, uh, you know, monopolistic practices, you know, unlike with Android, and we can get into this, uh, you know, the App Store is the only game in town for Apple. And I think, uh, you know, in, in recent years uh, between, you know, regulators and app developers and a, a lot of people who are starting to feel like, uh, Apple and you know big tech companies generally, uh, you know, are a little bit too you know monopolistic, have too much power, uh, and so we're seeing cases like this. We're seeing things going on uh, in the European Union. We're hearing voices in Congress talking about uh, you know how some of these companies might just gotten a little bit too uh, too big for their own good. And this case here has been something that uh, has been in the news quite a bit. And so I figured uh, we'd have you on to talk about it today. So just I guess my first question: What's going on between Apple uh, and Epic Games? I mean, we know that Epic, uh, who you know, runs Fortnite, which is a very popular uh, among the young people or so i hear uh you know game uh, where essentially the business model of that for those who are not aware is that it's it's free to play um but if you want to have you know add-ons and upgrades and cosmetic items you know you pay for uh, v bucks uh, as they're called which is like an in-game currency and that's something that's uh subjected to apple's 30 percent uh you know cut of you know the revenue share in their app store uh and then of course epic last year decided you know we're gonna have our own payment system against apple's rules apple uh, you know, removes the app from the app store, the Epic files suit against Apple. And, and, and here we are. So what's going on with the suit with these companies? Uh, yeah. So, and, and first off, uh, you know, it, it could be that you say, uh, I, I have, this is what I've hear, you know, about, uh, Fortnite. I've never played it myself, but if so, you're, you're unlike the rest of your demographic where, you know, something about, uh, people kind of middle school through their, uh, early 20s, you know, there's a huge number of people who have at least played Fortnite some. So, so if you're not in that crowd, you, uh, you're, you're a little out of the mainstream, I guess I would say. But uh, to your question, um, so, you know, Fortnite's this uh, game, it's this big universe, you can run around and shoot people, you can build up all sorts of things. And it's really popular. You can play it on consoles like Xbox and PlayStation, you can play it on a PC, you can play it on map, Mac, and then they also have a mobile version, which I hear is less good, but I guess people are into it and, and they play it on their Android uh, and iPhone devices. And so uh, Epic Games has been, you know, has, has had Fortnite and offered it for, for a number of years now. It's been a big revenue generator, uh, just iPhone um, uh, revenue alone. I think in the trial said something like $700 million. So a big seller. And then they're selling it in other places as well. The issue, as you already said in this case, is that um, Apple charges app developers uh, a fee, takes a cut for apps in games being in the App Store and on the iPhone. Apple has what we call a walled garden. Apple provides software, hardware, apps, access, all of that is one cohesive unit. Uh, so you buy an iPhone, it comes with the software Apple wants you to have. If you want to have certain apps or games, Apple is going to be the one who will vet those through its uh, process of letting things be added to the App Store after vetting. And Apple says the reason they do this is for security, 
for ease of use, for safety, um, for a more elegant solution. And that if people don't like that, they can go buy, you know, Android phones where there's a lot more kind of opened up uh, environment to, to add all sorts of things to the phone. So, so what's going on? Let me just pause for a moment because there's a lot to talk about. But what's going on is Apple has its app store, which sells apps and games. Uh, the majority of which are, as you said, given away for free. Some never charge a fee. Some people just like making apps and they give them away free. Uh, but a number of them either charge you, you know, a dollar, two dollars, five dollars, and still others charge you up front or don't charge at all, but then have in-app purchases. So if uh, if you play a you know a game like Candy Crush or something and you want to buy more lives or more tools. Uh, you can you can click to do that in the app, and you can use your Apple Pay or whatever you've set up, and uh, you can buy that. When you buy uh, stuff in Fortnite, Apple takes a thirty percent cut of all all uh, revenue that's generated through apps and games that are that are on the iPhone. And Epic doesn't like it. Epic doesn't want to give up 30% of its revenue. It wants to give up a lot less. It suggested at trial like 3%. All that Apple is doing is being a payment processor. So, uh, but it signed a contract where it agreed to this, doesn't want to have that happen anymore, wants that more of that revenue back. So it breached the contract about 18 months ago uh, and then immediately rolled out a media campaign complete with an advertisement, free Fortnite, started the Coalition for App Developer Fairness, and sued Apple and Google, actually, for antitrust violations. And Judge Gonzalez Rogers has just uh, wrapped up this past uh, Monday a three, just over three-week trial on that. So that's kind of some of the background of how we got to where we are. Okay, excellent. Now, you, you spoke about you know this term that's been thrown around, and it's this case you know, sort of describing uh, Apple's app store as a walled garden. Uh, now, for those that don't know, is it sort of you know works with these platforms between Android and Apple. Android, you know, you're able to, and this was what you know the uh, sort of a critical part of the case is that Android users are sort of able to install apps. You know, side load, I believe, is the term you can you know put on apps uh, in you know a more flexible way, which is where with iOS you're really relegated to just using Apple's App Store. And so, if you want, uh, if you're a developer and you want to you know sell apps, uh, and I think one of the expressions used in, in the trial by Epic's lawyers, and this is not verbatim, um, but there were comparisons to you know sort of the idea of a, of a of a mall where there's only one store and Apple gets Apple's the store. You can't open your own store. There's only this one medium to, to get your apps onto, onto iPhone, onto iOS. And if you want to do business there, you have to basically cough up 30% um, to Apple. Now, Apple, uh, you know, Tim Cook was, was, uh, you know, question in this case, you know, talked about uh, emphasizing you know, security, how, you know, Apple, you know, having dominion over in, in essence, how apps are able to get onto iOS is beneficial to consumers because Apple vets the apps. There's, you know, uh, you know, in terms of security and privacy and other sort of guidelines they have to try to, you know, keep people safe or keep people secure, um, you know, which, which could be one benefit of, of, of that level of, uh, you know, re restriction in terms of how you're able to, you know, people are able to get software onto your, onto your phone. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, there, there, there's strong arguments to be made in terms of, you know, being anti-competitive. I mean, if, if you're the only game in town and you, you know, want to sell uh, apps to consumers, and this is obviously something that, as you know, this technology has become more and more part of our lives, this has sort of transformed. Uh, I think many people would agree um, over the last you know decade plus to you know get to the point where where we're at now, where in essence, um, Apple is you know very much like a store. They're very much like a, a mall. They do have a tremendous control uh, over you know your the consumer's ability to, to to you know have software and use services on their phone, as well as developers' ability uh, to sell those things and how much it should cost everyone. Um, so do you see, you know, the, this idea of the walled garden of, of the app store is something that, uh, is, is necessary, uh, to, to protect people's, you know, cybersecurity and their, their information and, you know, protect, I guess, you know, minors from things that maybe shouldn't be on their phone or, uh, you know, in sort of weighing this out, do you believe that, you know, sort of this issue of there really being no other way to do business, uh, on an iPhone, if you're a developer, uh, you know, the, the argument that that's anti-competitive to be a stronger, to be a stronger argument. Yeah, I mean, that goes to the fundamental issue in the case, but also a fundamental issue of antitrust law. So um, there's two different ways to think about this. And, and you're kind of queuing up the question is like, you know, if you and I or, or experts were to get together and look at this, what would we say is the best way for a kind of 
software and apps and purchases to be able to be done on the iPhone, right? Like what, what would we come up with as the best policy? Now, in general, antitrust law is very hesitant to uh, wade into those that kind of decision making. And so in general, antitrust law says, you know, we don't want judges or regulators trying to figure out what's the best business model. We want the market to do that. And so, you know, let different things, uh, um, let people do different things. If Apple wants to do a walled garden and if, you know, uh, Samsung wants to load Android and have more open, uh, just let people decide what they want to do in the market. So that's the general default of antitrust is market competition. There's a, um, it's not even implicit. It's an explicit belief that market competition in general is going to get us the best kind of consumer well-being. Where antitrust law comes in is when we have a market failure uh, or when we have collusion, right? When we have price fixing. Um, one of those market failures is if a company becomes so powerful, becomes a monopolist, which in and of itself is not illegal to kind of gain monopoly power by doing something really well, uh, for instance. But once you have market power, if you try to kind of squelch competitors, if you uh, try to keep others from having opportunities, if you try to control resources that competitors have to have to um, survive, then you can be in violation because we're trying to fix a market failure. So what that means here is it goes to another thing you said, which is Apple seems to be the only game in town. Well, that's the question. That's the first uh, fundamental question is, is Apple the only game in town or do we have market competition? And that comes down to uh, what we always say, and for students who've taken uh, antitrust law, you know, so much of an antitrust case depends on market definition. What is the market? Apple says the market is every device on which you can play Fortnite, in which case you have lots of options uh, and Apple doesn't have market power, much less monopoly. Um, Epic argues that either the App Store or maybe iOS, uh, that those are the relevant market. And therefore you do Apple, you know, because Apple controls it the way you said, if we say that's the relevant market, then uh, Apple looks like a monopolist. And then, you know, they're going towards um, their, their payment system. We would really have to dig into that question you're asking. Is this more pro-competitive or anti-competitive? And how do we do that? We start getting into what are the pro-competitive justifications? Like, okay, it streams, streamlines things to have just 30%. It keeps Apple from paying, you know, charging developers anything other than the $99 developer toolkit fee. Um, it, it, you know, uh, the, the fact that the 30% hasn't ever changed, Apple argues that that's not evidence that uh, there's not competition because instead of prices going down, what Apple says is they keep improving the iPhone and now you can play all sorts of games and do all sorts of apps that you couldn't have in the past so that you know, and, and antitrust regulators say, yeah, sure, competition can come through quality improvements, not just uh, price cuts. So, so we get into those arguments. And then Epic on the other side says, like, developers are unhappy. They had Down Dog Yoga app, uh, um, the CEO testified. They had others. So, so Epic got into developers aren't happy. You're not really innovating. Uh, it's not fair because a lot of developers put their apps out basically for free and we're subsidizing the market effectively, which is true. Uh, and so that argument is, is where we go. If Epic's market definition is accepted, then we get to that. And that's a really tough question. And the judge was definitely, and, and that's what I was talking about in the quote you read earlier, the judge is definitely wrestling with, uh, if, Apple is a monopolist. How do you kind of, what's the right way to go? What's the right remedy? So getting into those questions, but before the judge can get there, she's going to have to determine market definition. And on that front, Epic really has more of the uphill battle because there's only one case, a uh, Supreme Court case in history that has said that a manufacturer's own product line can be the market. Uh, otherwise markets have always been defined more broadly because as you can, you know, you can imagine the, the potential problem with defining the market that if I define the market as Ford cars, Ford's a monopoly. If I define it as, you know, Schwinn bicycles, uh, uh, Schwinn, if that even still exists, is, is the monopoly, you know, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, that would be a lot of regulation. 
Now, some people in the kind of neo-Brandeisian um, school of thought love this idea. And this is to your point about, you know, where are we going on tech regulation? What's going on in the EU? Some people love this idea and say, yes, we should start defining big tech platforms. They do have so much power. They are so important. There are no good substitutes for them. Let's define them as monopolists. And let's just, you know, really start getting regulation in there through antitrust law. And so that's why this case is so important. And so many people are watching it because, you know, it's not just about Fortnite players. But if this case really comes out strongly in Epic's favor, uh, Google, uh, you know, YouTube, Google with YouTube, uh, um, Amazon, uh, all of these different, you know, uh, Twitter, Facebook, they're all kind of shaking in their boots because they could be next. Interesting. That was very, very insightful. So, you know, just going off of that, you know, as you said, you know, this 30 percent and as Apple indicated that this, you know, uh, revenue sharing agreement has been in place uh, for a very long time, you know, since the App Store sort of came to be, you know, I think it's been over a decade now, I believe 2008 is when the App Store first uh, came to be, you know, there's expressions that we've heard, you know, uh, over time, like there's an app for that, you know, it's sort of been a, a somewhat, you know, whimsical and beloved feature of the iPhone is that you can have all these apps. And, you know, obviously, you know, e even though, you know, sort of the, the, the ecosystem, the business arrangement that's in place has been uh, longstanding, it, it certainly goes without saying that in, in, you know, recent times, particularly in the last uh, few years, the attitudes of, you know, regulators, whether that's, you know, uh, in the EU or, or even in Washington, now there's been voices that have started to kind of go against the grain with big tech. Uh, you know, companies like Epic Games and other developers have started to uh, become more vocal and expressing their, their displeasure with, uh, you know, the, the, the way that this market tends to work. Uh, and now, obviously, this this suit has uh, has, been, has been brought. And that's, uh, you know, what we've been talking about here. So I guess my question is, why now? Why is it in the last few years there has been this, um, you know, sort of, I don't know if you would say sudden, but there's definitely been a palpable um you know, you know, sea change in terms of attitudes on the part of, you know, industry and, and you know, regulators uh, and, and, you know, taking a taking a look at what's really going on uh, with Apple and other platforms, like, like you mentioned, what, what's changed? What, what, what's what's kind of led to where we're at now? That's a, that's a good question. That's an interesting question. And I think like a lot of, you know, potentially big shifts, I, I'm not sure we've shifted yet that much, but there's pressure to shift. Um, there's a number of factors that are are coming into play. Um, you know, the market has just gotten big enough. Uh, you know, for the for Epic Games of the world are, are making enough money uh, that, uh, you know, uh, um, spending tens of millions of dollars on a lawsuit to try to um, change the deal so they could pay a lot less money. Uh, and that would be worth, you know, hundreds of millions to them. Makes sense. I think that's part of it. Um but I think part of it's the political moment we're in and, and all of the political kind of, you know, the same reason we're looking at Section 230 and whether uh, the protections uh, for, you know, platforms that moderate content uh, and, and therefore are not treated as publishers. So they can't be sued for um, defamation just because they do some content moderation. Uh, the way the EU has worried about Google especially, but others as well, uh, Amazon as well, but Google preferencing its own content, feeling like Google's become very big and powerful. So I, I think part of what's going on is that same thing that was going on back with Standard Oil uh, when the first antitrust laws were passed, which is to some extent a fear of bigness. Uh, you know, the massive railroads in the late 1800s were like nothing the, the country had ever seen. I mean, there were so many fundamental changes of connecting all these rail lines having all that power, same with Standard Oil. Uh, you know, I mean, it changed life so much as it, it used to be that all sorts of jurisdictions and locations throughout the U.S. would just have their own time zone because no, it never mattered. You weren't really doing things across time zones. Well, railroads part of what changed that. So it felt like it shifted life a lot. And I think if you think about, the, you know, big tech and the Internet and social media, and uh, shopping, it really feels like big tech has shifted our lives a lot, has made a, a big impact. And then they're really big and seemingly accountable, you know, only to themselves, although I'd act, argue actually they're, they're highly accountable and highly tuned into what their customers are, are, are wanting, right? Um, and so I think that's part of it. And, and part of it is, you know, the, it's gotten pulled into some of the partisanship that we have going on. 
But on the academic side, you've had a few writers uh, starting in, in really just recently, like 2018 was when one of the more prominent articles was published saying, wait, let's go back to a Brandeis, you know, a, a, a Justice Brandeis uh, before he was a justice was a big crusader for, for really trying to regulate and have a lot of government intervention in big companies. Uh, antitrust law moved away from that over the last six, five or six decades and really said that that doesn't work well. It's hard for judges to balance those competing interests. And so had really just focused on consumer welfare as in, you know, what's the situation? Will consumers get more goods at lower prices, more variety, more quality? If so, great. That's, that's our focus. Um, but there's been a move to say like, no, no, we should do more because the tech platforms are, are so powerful. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, just going off of your point about, uh, you know, sort of section 230 and obviously this issue, you know, the one commonality, uh, there is that the law that's on the books that sort of governs uh, these topics is quite old. You know, obviously in the case of Section 230, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, big tech companies, Facebook and you know, Twitter and, uh, you know, YouTube and you know, these platforms, which are relatively novel, you know, in, in terms of, you know, how old the law is. You know, the, the law that governs that is, you know, over two decades old from a time where, you know, the Internet was something that you had to dial into. When we talk about antitrust and, uh, you know, uh, Apple and Epic Games, I mean, we're talking about cases about railroads that are, you know, over 100 years old. So it's very... Uh, I think difficult, you might say, to try to you know take this very old law and apply it to very high tech um, modern issues. So, do you see you know in, in this case you know there there being an issue of trying to to get this old law and sort of wrestle with it to try to uh, get it to apply to you know very modern issues that we have today, where we don't really have much law in the books that tells us um, you know how how an app store should work and, and how you define a, a tech monopoly. Or do, I guess if you could speak to that issue of just trying to get very old law to, to apply to things that are very much new and novel. Yeah, um, great question, and that is something people are talking about now. Um, if if you look at what antitrust law has become, though, over the last, as I said, like you know, five decades now, um, you'll see that the kind of economic analysis and critique of prior antitrust cases has really um, helped shape antitrust law, so that it's become very sophisticated and. It's not about just precedence about railroads, but it's about how do we look at competitive at market landscapes? How do we look at commercial landscapes? And what are the questions we ask to try to figure out if something is competitive or not? And so, for instance, whether it's a railroad, uh, a group of railroads that have control of a terminal that you need to access to get, you know, across the St. Louis River or the uh, Mississippi River in St. Louis, rather. Or it's you know Apple with control of its app store. We're, we're, the, the economic fundamentals actually are not that different. In that, what we're trying to ask is, well, if these railroads can't go across here, are they able to effectively compete throughout this middle region of the country? Or if they have to go hundreds of miles out of way, does that mean they can't really compete? Well, you know, okay, if that wouldn't be efficient, would could they just build their own kind of terminal and bridge? And well, if that's really inefficient, so it's unlikely, then we get to the point where we say, like, you know what, we're going to make them share, right? And if you take that analysis, that that mode of analysis, and, and apply it to Apple and the market definition question, we're, we're asking the same thing. Okay, if Epic can't load, you know, can't have its own app store on iOS, that's one of the things that Epic has said it, it would like, right? Or if Epic can't do its own purchasing system, in-app purchases within the game, will Epic be able to compete? Well, what do we mean compete? Because in the antitrust law, we don't really care about competitors. We care about kind of consumer welfare. So will people be able to play Fortnite? Will there be kind of a dynamic environment for games and apps out there? Will you know this kind of happen? And so the, the technicalities of it and what we have to look at to try to figure that out, those are going to be different. But that's the fundamental question we, we want to ask, which is, um, you know, seems like Fortnite, lots of people are playing it. It's, it's doing well. Uh, they might not like the cut they're giving Apple, uh, but usually we want to see some real harm to consumers before we come in and say, you know what, Apple, you have a business model, you have a plan, you have IP, but we're going to start telling you how to use it. And, and so that same type of analysis, I would argue, um, we know how to do in, in, in antitrust law. Now, getting the technical details right can be hard, right? Uh, that's with any lawsuit. Uh, if, if you don't really get the facts right and, and drill down and 
we want good experts. And certainly they had some of the best economic experts there are, and they completely disagreed on the market. Uh, so I'm not saying it's easy, um, but I don't think we have to invent new law myself personally, or really shift the way we do antitrust law. But I will tell you, uh, people disagree with me, right? So there, I think I'm still, you know, this position is, was, was conventional wisdom two years ago. It's still very much the mainstream, I would say, but there's, there's growing dissent. Uh, and I actually think Communications Decency Act and uh, Section 230 are, are similar because, yes, while, you know, um, um, Prodigy and AOL, you know, AOL was its own little walled garden back in, in the time 230 was passed. But it was kind of the same fundamental issue. Like, do we want AOL to be treated like a publisher such that every decision they make, like if they leave up content that's defamatory, they can now be sued. Well, if we, you know, if, if that were the case, then AOL would either not allow any user generated content to be put up or would um, censor nothing, in which case, you know, it becomes kind of the open sewer of the internet. And even though, you know, you can put up videos now, the things we can share are much more sophisticated. Um, again, I'm not sure the fundamental question has changed. All right, great. Uh, another question I had, you know, there was one thing that came up, you know, during this, the, the, the trial where they, you know, had all kinds of, you know, emails from Apple executives that were, you know, uh, looked at, and there was one email in particular, you know, there were a few emails that, you know, you might consider particularly damning, you know, there was one in particular where I forget it was uh, Phil Schiller or Tim Cook was someone at Apple was, um, you know, they were having a discussion of whether or not, you know, the iMessage, uh, you know, c- capability of iPhone should be something that, uh, you can access on Android. So, you know, of course, as I'm sure many people are familiar with, if you have an iPhone and you text someone with Android, you can, you know, it's a, it's a green, you know, the, the, those are your green bubble friends. You can't access the full suite of features that you can if they also own an iPhone and they have iMessage. And, you know, they said, well, no, you know, in essence, let's not, you know, we, we don't want to do that. You know, if they want that, they can have an iPhone. Um, and, and there's, you know, an, an, an Epic, you know, quite well, you know, it's kind of able to go through different areas of, you know, the iOS ecosystem that sort of paint a picture of a company that's, you know, created a situation that is, um, you know, anti-competitive. And I know you just brought up the argument of, you know, antitrust law being concerned with harm to the consumer, not necessarily affirms, um, you know, competitors. But overall, when you take a step back and you start to look at some of these um, arguments and some of the discovery and some of what's, um, you know, come out the trial, uh, you know, the argument, I, I think, can certainly be made that this is, um, you know, the, the, there are problems with, you know, Apple's business model. At the same time, you know, when you look at Epic Games, um, there's sort of a whole other, you know, litany of arguments of people who want to go against Epic who say, you know, this, this freemium business model, as it's called, where, you know, your kid can get Fortnite on the phone. It's free, but you know, if you want to look like all the cool kids and have all the attachments and the upgrades, it's going to, you know, you're going to have to pay for that, uh, you know, in-game currency consistently. And that adds up. There's been issues, um, you know, in the, in the, in the law of, you know, regulators looking to, you know, these companies and, 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 you know, sort of like, like Apple and, you know, trying to put more restrictions on, you know, the ability of, uh, you know, kids to just be able to willy nilly buy all kinds of, you know, in-game currency. And at a certain point, it does sort of feel, feel like both of the, these companies have, uh, have mud on them in a way. And I guess, you know, judge Gonzalez Rogers in this case is sort of, you know, not, not sort of, but is, um, you know, now in this place where you have to weigh out, you know, both sides and figure out what kind of, solution would, uh, you know, w- w- would be equitable, which, you know, as, as you alluded to, um, you know, there's challenges in that. And how does, you know, how does a court, you know, go to Apple and start telling Apple how it's, how its business model should work. So in trying, and, you know, of course, and you could probably uh, speak to this, I know you spoke to it, you know, in, in your article, you know, the, the judge, you know, Judge Gonzalez Rogers was, you know, somewhat skeptical of, of Apple. It does not seem like a slam dunk uh, at all for them and nor is it for, for Epic Games, but you know, w- what type of outcome here, sort of balancing the equities, as it's so often said, do you think would be reasonable? Do you think we could expect? Like, what what are the ways this could go? Yeah. So um, when we talk about equity, and and you know, the judge has injunctive power, so she can give injunctive relief, of course, which which is based in equity rather than law. Um, but um, when we when we talk about antitrust analysis, what we're really doing is, is we want a pro-competitive result, right? We, we want to stop anti-competitive behavior. And we want a pro-competitive result. And one of the ways to do that is, is to use the equitable remedies. But first, we've got to kind of figure out what, what gets us to pro-competitiveness. And so the green bubbles are an interesting issue. Like generally, we allow competitors who do not have market power, you know, when there's a bunch of competitors in a space, they can come up with all sorts of strategies where they try to 
make their products sticky or lock in consumers or, you know, make your data not portable. And, you know, some of that is annoying and it would be kind of nice if everything was more portable. But antitrust law, you know, uh, um, um, Phil Rita, uh, back in the day, one of the most famous antitrust scholars uh, said, you know, antitrust law should never uh, say there's a problem where, where the judge can't craft a remedy. And so judges are always worried about, you know, breaking up someone's business model or trying to figure out like, okay, we're going to tell you how to redo your business. And so a lot of the kind of uh, hurly burly and rough and tumble, uh, um, uh, sharp elbows market competition is allowed when competitors don't have market power. So you want to make it so iMessage doesn't talk, uh, uh, doesn't do a blue bubble uh, when it's on an Android device. And then you want to like, you know, uh, there's no evidence that, that Apple's done this, but but there are memes out there. Uh, there's no evidence Apple supported these memes or got them started, but there are memes out there about, oh, you know, when you see the green bubble, you know, the person you're talking to is poor, right? Like <laughs> terrible sounding things like that, that, that people put out on social media where Apple, you know, is, you know, Apple, someone at Apple's in, in marketing sitting there going like, yes, this is what we want. We want people to think blue bubble, premium good. You can only get that from an iPhone. So if the judge decides that the market definition means is such that Apple has market power, then looking at those kinds of what would be allowed without market power, those sort of things to try to keep consumers from shifting uh, whether it's data portability, whether it's making devices not interoperate well, those can all then become violations of antitrust law once market power is established, because then you've got a lot more scrutiny on you. So the judge could say, you've got to, um, I mean, that's that's not one of the issues in, in this case, but, but what is an issue is, you know, the judge could say, allow competing app stores. The judge could say, allow in-app payment. Um, Judge Gonzalez Rogers seemed to have a lot of hesitancy on that because she, you know, she noted that would be blowing up Apple's business model as far as the App Store goes and, and even uh, the Walled Garden. Uh, and so where she kept coming back to in her questioning was, well, what about just um, getting rid of calling the anti-competitive, the anti-steering uh, portion of the contract that Apple makes people sign? So the anti-steering says you can't anywhere in the app or in your description of your game uh, say, by the way, you can go buy, for instance, V-Bucks, you know, online, just click out to Safari, buy online, then you can use them in the game and, and you know, at a cheaper rate. Uh, and there's all this argument back and forth about whether Apple, you know, should have to do that. If the judge wants to select a remedy that wouldn't fundamentally uh, challenge Apple's walled garden approach, uh, but would, she seems, she seemed skeptical that the 30% having never changed uh, that that all the innovation was being done such that that was purely competitive. She seemed skeptical of that. So if she wanted to put some pressure on that but not blow up Apple's uh, business model, she could say, look, this provision of the contracts that says you can't tell people that they can go somewhere else and buy, you know, make the purchases and then use those purchases in the game, those are all struck down as anti-competitive. Uh, and, and that, I think, is a kind of approach that that – you know, it's always hard to say what a judge is going to do from her questions because sometimes she's she's just feeling things out. Uh, but based on her questions, that that seems like where she might be going, and that would be a much more kind of um, defensible on appeal kind of opinion from her, I think. Interesting. Um, so a few more questions. Uh, so I, I guess just looking at um, you know both sides, Epic and Apple. I guess what are the you know because ultimately you know these are two companies with you know tremendous profit and tremendous lawyers that uh, are, are you know, going to be able to continue this for, for some time. Um, I guess, what are the strengths and weaknesses just strategically at trial for, for, for both Apple, you know, and Epic, it seems like both sides have, you know, they, they both have strong arguments, but both also have some, some weak points that have been raised by counsel. So what, well, I, I guess, how, how does it turn in terms of, you know, strengths and weaknesses, things to watch out for, for, for each side? Yeah. So, um, Dan Lyons, who obviously also a professor here at BC, uh, he was I, I, he was talking about this um, in another uh, article I read, uh, and he was arguing that you know this could be an epic a, a win for Epic Games even if they lose the court case. They've gotten a ton of publicity. Uh, a lot more people now know about V Bucks and that you can go outside of the uh, App Store without them having to put a notice up. 
Um, developer sentiment seems to have kind of turned on Apple some. This may end up putting enough pressure that, that Apple moves some uh, on some of this. It's certainly got publicity for Epic's um, uh, Unreal Engine and it's competing, kind of wanting to compete with Steam and wanting to compete in these sort of ways. So, you know, it's a lot of money to do a case like this and to have the caliber of lawyers in a three-week trial. I mean, we're, we're literally talking and the experts, tens of, of millions of dollars, uh, but certainly not not anywhere up to close to hundreds of millions. But, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the bill is somewhere between 10 and $20 million. But if you get a little movement from Apple on this, if they come down a few percent, it, if, if something like that, if you get a lot more people coming to your store outside, that could easily pay itself back for Epic. So in some ways, if, if that's the metric, Epic could win uh, overall, it could make have good ROI, good return on investment, even if it completely loses at trial. Apple, on the other hand, has, has seen its reputation beat up some. It's, it's taken a drubbing, as you said. Um, they've been aired uh, kind of dirty laundry that developers aren't happy, that you know, the kind of internal emails that most companies have you know, because business people and marketing people, of course, they always want to try to do things that hurt competitors and keep people from switching. Um, but it doesn't sound good when that comes out in the open. Uh, and if you have market power, it can become a violation. So I think Apple has already been hurt some. Uh, if it goes against them, they're hurt a lot more. If if the anti-steering comes into place, I think we'll see Apple getting really creative uh, because they're not just going to let people put stuff up for free and never get any money. They're going to start charging developers and maybe charging per download. So it would be an interesting world to see what might happen uh, if it comes out against Apple. Although I don't think we'll see anything, you know, the judge is probably not going to release an opinion for, for weeks to, to two or three months. And then I would think if she rules for Epic, she would probably be willing to stay that opinion as it goes in, in undoubtedly to appeal and maybe if we're lucky, all the way to the Supreme Court, because the court, the Supreme Court weighs in on this sort of thing, um, not as often as we antitrust professors would like. So we're, you know, we end up taking like the Kodak case that I was talking about earlier, where that's the market is from 1992. So it'd be great to get an update on uh, the court's thinking on these issues. Right. And it would, it would certainly be needed. I guess my last question is, you know, exactly as you, you sort of started to allude to there, are we, you know, sort of looking at, you know, Apple versus Epic Games, looking at, you know, broader attitudes that are sort of turning against uh, you know, big tech and, you know, so some of the political issues of the last few years and, you know, just this overall, you know, regulatory landscape where you have very old law that's being applied to very, you know, modern issues and it's being done, you know, imperfectly. And we have all these, you know, questions now that we haven't had to face before and, you know, in terms of, you know, data privacy and protection, uh, you know, algorithms, uh, effect on society, these are just very large, um, you know, issues that I think a lot of, you know, big tech for the last, two decades have sort of enjoyed not having to necessarily, you know, wrestle with. And it's been extremely problematic because you have, you know, on the one hand, a business model uh, for, I guess, if you take, you know, the, the 230 issue of, you know, social media companies that do, uh, you know, profit from division and profit from some things that go on on their platforms that uh, I don't think many would agree are positive things for uh, society. But at the same time, the, the law, you know, again, we talk about 230 from a time where, you know, I, I remember having to go down to, the, the drugstore and buy a card that you, you gave you like a hundred minutes to dial into AOL, you know, that that's not the environment anymore. Things are very different with, with phones and, and all the technology we have now. And then obviously with, you know, Apple and, uh, you know, Epic games, the way people play games and pay for them and act, it's, it's very different today than the era in which a lot of our law was written. So do you think we're, you know, at a crossroads here, I guess, you know, you allude to maybe the Supreme court could weigh in on this case, perhaps someday, uh, you know, what one might hope, but, uh, where do you think this this time that we're in now is heading? Is this a, a, a sea change from a regulatory standpoint, or is this just kind of a, a blip on the on the horizon? Do you think things will just go back to you know uh, the the public's attention being elsewhere, or if you're a big tech company, if you're you know concerned about uh, you know antitrust being labeled a monopolist, are you you know starting to you know shake in your boots as you said? Mm -hmm. So you're, I don't know if you want to do litigation, but you're going to be a good litigator if you decide to be one. Good deposition skills because, uh, you know, you just asked me the same question in, in a leading way. Wait a minute. Isn't this really, uh, haven't, uh, hasn't the tech changed enough that the regulations are out of date? So I'm not going to, and that's a great deposition technique because uh, often 
uh, uh, you know, the opposing witness from the other side will then be like, well, I, I answered that, but he asked it again in the week. So maybe I should shift my position a little. So it's excellent technique. I'm not going to take the bait. I'm going to stick to my guns and say, I think that the law has the tools, you know, the law continues, you know, the, to develop through the, through the cases. But I think the law really has the tools it needs uh, to do antitrust in the way we've known it. I don't think that's going to change. But I do think you're right that the environment within which law is working has changed. And so we might see uh, not only regulatory attention, we may see legislation uh, to change. I mean, there's already some that's been uh, um, introduced um, by Democrats in Congress. Um, but it's interesting where we're at, right? So when tech companies first started, uh, you know, getting popular, growing, uh, Democrats tended to like them because they're innovative. They, um, they were, you know, opening up the world. They're connecting people. Uh, they're cool. Uh, Republicans liked them because Republicans were typically pro-business and like great entrepreneurism, perfect. Democrats, I would say, shifted uh, against uh, big tech more quickly, worrying about the bigness, the power, privacy, that sort of thing. But now we're at a point where a lot of Republicans are shifting and are against big tech because they're worried about censorship and, again, the power and that sort of thing. We're kind of in a more populous stage generally or age generally. And so once both parties have kind of shifted against you and once you have things like Marco Rubio in Florida saying, good, I hope that that warehouse does uh, organize into a labor union against Amazon, right? Once, once both sides, you know, once, once Republicans start taking positions that were traditionally Democrat positions because they don't like big tech, well, antitrust law may still be able to do the job, but uh, Congress may come in and, and see it very differently. And Congress may be the one who says, Nope, I don't think the way we've done this before is sufficient. I think the landscape has changed enough. And even if it's not purely consumer welfare, technical antitrust reasons, I want to rein in big tech in, in, in some sort of way. And that could come in the forms of changing antitrust law, or it could come in changing protections for what's published, or it could come in some other, uh, you know, even heavy handed, more heavy handed uh, way. I, I really have no idea, but if I were tech companies and, and you can see it from the increases in their spending on lobbying, yeah, they're, I don't know if they're shaking in their boots, but they're, 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 they're not, you know, standing comfortably in their boots right now to overwork that metaphor. Interesting. Yeah. That's a, it's a lot of big thoughts, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I'll have to go try to brush up some more of my litigation skills. Maybe Epic Games might need to hire me to, uh, to, to try to fight Apple and Google and and the rest of them, see what kind of questions I can muster then. But no, uh, that was well anyways. done. I mean, I've, I've sat in with very experienced litigators using exactly that technique. And I'm not saying you were trying to trick me, but I, I just, I, I think that I just, to... I, I wanted to wrap up on that question. I was like, Ooh, I asked that before, but I kind of want to go out on that note. So I was like, let's see if we can't, you know, uh, finish strong. But anyway, any, any event, Professor Olson, thank you for coming on. That's all I had. Uh, again, Professor Olson, Professor at PC Law, also my advisor, give him a shout out for that. Uh, IP, antitrust, all those uh, courses that, that people can take. And we'll have to just keep paying attention here to what happens uh, with Judge Gonzalez Rogers' decision in this case and, you know, what kind of happens with uh, this industry, which, you know, as we said, uh, there's, a, there's a lot going on uh, with, with these issues today. So thank you for coming on and speaking with us. I'm very happy to see that my software did not tell me I'm out of space before I was able to wrap up and record my outro. So I'm very happy about that and uh, happy you were able to join us. And uh, thank you again for coming on.